Everyone following us in our social media page is going to be listening to this on, on Radio Nukalofa at 8.6 FM. Um, today I've got the uh, pleasure to talk to our Speaker of Parliament, uh, Lord Fafanua. Uh, Lord Fafanua, before we start, I'd like to thank you for always, uh, allow, always saying yes to our conversation. Uh, but before we start, I would like if I can ask if we can take off our mask. That's okay. Because uh, we are beyond the two meter distance, social distance. Lord Fafanua, our interview today or our conversation today will be based on, on Parliament. My question, is it an unwritten rule that these nobles have to vote one way? And second to that, do you have an in, any insight on why that there was a split in the nobles' vote last year for our Prime Minister? I think um, the fact that the nobles actually split um, in the Prime Minister's election last year is is probably testament to the quality of candidates that were on offer. Um, you know, it was, they were both um, good candidates and, and I think um, the convention of the nobles voting as a bloc um, was uh, obviously split as a result. Um, my question for you, uh, Lord Fafanua, is can you talk about the support and the rally behind our country, not just from our people, our Tongan people in New Zealand and overseas, but uh, many other communities got together uh, to rally to support and help our country. The, the amount of support that we received um, from all around the world and, and to see firsthand um, Tongans unite in, in New Zealand um, and also the you know, other Pacific Islands for our people, it was very, um, it was very heartwarming. Um, and, and the fact that we, one of the committees organised the containers to be packed at Mount Smart was kind of reminiscent of Mate Matonga. The Prime Minister uh, has got some uh, recent news of uh, three of his cabinet ministers uh, have been found guilty for bribery. Um, a people's representative has been found guilty for bribery. That's four parliamentarians, uh, Lord Fafanua, that's been found guilty for bribery. Um, how does that affect Parliament? Yeah, I, well, the fact that um, three of them are in Cabinet mm. affects Parliament in that um, our first agenda for this year is the government budget. Mm. And uh, the Prime Minister has um, sent a letter to the Speaker um, and to Parliament requesting that we defer mm. um, the schedule sitting from 16th of May. Um, due to the fact that um, all of this is happening within the government. Uh, but this, uh, the delay will allow government to um, refocus itself and um, present the budget um, as they were supposed to. That deferral of parliament is the date set by you, the Speaker of Parliament, or is it set by, by the Prime Minister and, and Cabinet? Well, actually, you have to remember that um, the work of Parliament foremostly is to pass legislation mm. and the budget is the most important legislation because we need to finance all the work of government. And um, the, the only agenda we have right now um, in terms of legislation is the government budget. So if the government's not ready with their budget, then that will have an impact on when Parliament will sit to deliberate that legislation. With the uh, four parliamentarians, especially with their verdict, uh, coming out guilty, um, are they unseated, Lord Fafanua, automatically uh, once the verdict is out, or do they wait uh, to, for Parliament to sit and, and, and Parliament unseats them? That's prescribed in the legislation. Um, under the Electoral Act, um, if, if a member of parliament is found guilty of um, committing uh, electoral bribery, yeah. then um, they will be unseated um, by parliament. By parliament yeah. uh, it, it actually says, um, shall be unseated by the Legislative Assembly. Yeah. Um, that unseating mm. will happen at the next sitting of parliament. Okay. The, the only precedence we've had for, for that, the last precedence was in 2016 with Lavo Lavo, where the Supreme Court certified um, that his election was void 
on a Friday and because Parliament was already sitting, he was unseated on the next sitting, which was the Monday after. Does these four parliamentarians uh, have to attend uh, the Parliament uh, to be unseated or can they be unseated with those seats vacant? They, they should be there. Yeah. Um, and, and whether they come or not, I think, is, is uh, not the point. <laughs> Uh, the, the point is that the Legislative Assembly needs to comply with the Electoral Act and um, go through with the unseating at the next sitting of the House. Uh, I know uh, the, the first sitting of, of Parliament is supposed to be the 16th of May, which is uh, next Monday. How does this delay affect everything? So by delaying the sitting of Parliament because the government's not ready with the budget, mm. Um, for those who are waiting to be unseated, mm. they will have a chance to lodge their appeal yeah. and um, potentially ask for the Supreme Court to, to stay the ruling. Mm. Um, no, to my knowledge, and back to 1990, mm. um, cases like this are, um, have not been granted a stay by the court. If any of these four parliamentarians uh, appeal to the Court of Appeal, uh, the decision from the Supreme Court um, and uh, as you mentioned on your answer before if this appeal is heard after you guys sit in Parliament for the unseating the unseating will continue? We, we have to go through the unseating okay. because the guilty verdict triggers the unseating yeah. Um, and the only thing they can undo that would be another Supreme Court. Yeah. As a matter of due process, Parliament has to do with the unseating. Um, and the delay right now could potentially allow those who are affected to go back to the courts. Um, and, and the thing is, we're un under the law, we, we have to submit the budget. And um, it has to be on our agenda before the end of the month before the 30th. So the, the delay cannot be beyond that. After, uh, say, these parliamentarians are unseated and then they appeal to the uh, Court of Appeal um, and the Supreme Court decision is overturned, do they get their seat back? If the seat is still vacant, and um, their void election is overturned, yeah. they become legitimate members, yeah. then they will assume their seat. But if the appeal is heard and we get a judgment after a by-election, mm. the seat will no longer be vacant for them to return to. And they will essentially become victims of the law. Okay. I know that the punishment that uh, all four of these parliamentarians got, uh, it isn't just to void uh, the election, uh, they're also banned for running again uh, for parliament for five years? They, they cannot run for parliament for five years, five years yeah. which basically stops them from returning after, over the next election, so there will be two terms out of parliament. Lord Fafanu, I asked you before um, about if the Supreme Court decision is overturned and their appeal to the Court of Appeal is successful, but if it's been heard after uh, the by-election, then they become a victim to the law. Would this mean that the five-year ban will be taken off them and they're eligible to run for the next election? Yes. Right. Yes, it will no longer apply. Okay. With these cases, and I know it's going to happen a lot with every election. There's going to be a civil court case. I'm quite optimistic, Lala, because yeah. I think that, um, you know, we, we're still in the early stages of our yeah. democracy. Yeah. And this is part of the teething issue. Yeah. Um, uh, my predecessor, Lord Lasike, when he lost his seat, even though that was a criminal case that he was acquitted of, um, those gaps in the law we filled so that... Um, the, if an appeal is heard from a criminal case and gets overturned, they can still return to their seat. But um, in terms of um, bribery uh, in, in, during the election, 
um, we're now finding out that there are some things that we need to refine in terms of the timeline. Mm. Um, and, and I believe that the reason why things have stretched out was because of the natural disaster on the 15th of January, yeah. followed by COVID, yeah. and that sort of impacted the schedule for these um, petitions to be heard. Yeah. But I think ideally, um, the Supreme Court in the future might hear these petitions after an election in November, in January or February, uh, meaning that the appeal could be heard by um, May, which is the mm. first Court of Appeal. Mm. So given that Court of Appeal sits on in May and around, I think, September, yeah. uh, they've, the current round of petitions have missed the May. Mm. And, and it would be up to the Lord Chief Justice to have a special session, but I, I can't speak to that. That's up to Chief Justice and the judges. And I'm optimistic as well, uh, Lord Fafanua, and um, what's happened now, the opinion that's come in from, from the people right now is um, to stay within the law of the uh, election commission uh, or I within the rules of the election commission. The law is really clear yeah. because it already states and gives you the boundary for, yeah. you know, what is a bribery, what is legitimate campaign. Yeah. There are limits to how much you can spend within the six months leading to the election. I think um, what these cases have done is clarified what the MP can do and what would give them um, reason to be petitioned. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's good for future elections yeah. and also for future candidates. Um, they'll be aware of where the limits are to what will be deemed illegal under the the Electoral Act. So, so in, in and and what is uh, legitimate campaign spending? Lord Fafanua, what you're saying is there's exemption within the Electoral Act uh, that allows these candidates uh, when it comes to gifting. The, the exemption there is for family. Okay. Um, so if if the candidate is um, spending money on on his family and their regular expenses, that's mm. exempted. And, and also charitable organizations and churches. But I think we still need to be careful because if it's in the ordinary donation that he makes, then, yeah. then that should be exempted anyway. So yeah. some of that nuance and interpretation will be up to the courts. And I think um, the recent judgments I haven't finished reading um, sort of helped clarify that as well. Yeah, and I saw the decision as well, Lord Fafanua, and I'm hoping the future candidates that's running for parliament will read the election law and also within our culture uh, follow uh, these laws. Yeah, the, maybe the, the parliament in the future might refine the electoral act. Yeah. Um, so there, there are talks about having like a sliding scale um, mm. for the amount because uh, what we've seen in the case is that, you know, $5 is the same as 7000 mm -hmm. um, I. I have reservations about applying a sliding scale because bribery should be black and white, not, yeah. not a gray area. Uh, but there are other ways of addressing people's concerns about that, like the cultural considerations. Cultural concerns, yeah. um, we, we can even um, put in, like, raise the limit yeah. uh, before bribery will be triggered. So different ways of addressing it, but I think it's something that both the Electoral Commission and Parliament will be looking at in the future, and hopefully we might um, help resolve some of these issues that have come up uh, from the election last year. Lord Fafanua, that's good news that uh, this conversation to refine the election law um, and no doubt it will benefit uh, the future uh, candidates that's about to run for parliament in the future. Um, is there a requirement for a quorum in parliament? Well, simple majority. Okay. So half the member, if we have um, half the members in the house, then um, the house can sit. And it, that's the same as, uh, for cabinet as well. Yeah. They need six members in cabinet. In uh, one of our previous conversation, I know we had a conversation uh, pre-election, and in, in one of my questions, I asked about the criteria that, that the, uh, these people or these uh, potential uh, people's representative or candidates need in them before running. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, from memory, I think they needed a clean bill of health. I don't think we require you to have a clean bill of health. Okay. Uh, but that's something that we think voters should be aware of. Um, if they want uh, a capable candidate, mm. 
um, a member who will not be sick half the time they're representing you, then yeah. they will elect someone who is who has a clean bill of health. Yeah, um, it's, just it's in the interest of the voter, um, even though it might be might not be specified. So yeah, um, Lord Fafanua, and the reason why I'm asking this question is um, uh, one of the people's representative who was uh, uh, voted in by his uh, his area. Um, He's also a cabinet minister chosen by the prime minister, but has been sick in New Zealand since uh, becoming a people's representative and also becoming a cabinet minister. The prime minister is uh, given the authority to appoint um, up to four ministers from outside um, parliament mm -hmm. and also appoint um, from the members of parliament who have been elected into legislative assembly. Um, MPs that he wants to be on his cabinet um, and that that discretion is with the Prime Minister. What about uh, for somebody to become a parliamentarian or people's representative uh, to also have it as a criteria uh, to have a clean bill of health before running for parliament uh, because um, as you mentioned it's a uh, representative government and this person or this uh, people's rep has not been able to represent his area be since becoming a people's rep because he's been sick. I, I think that uh, it's sort of like the free market. Um, people should um, choose responsibly mm. and, and um, they should um, elect the, the most capable member of parliament that, that they feel should represent them. And um, I, think, I think the clean bill of health is a bit like the level of education as well. Um, <laughs> so education, health, there's no uh, minimum yeah. uh, bar set by le legislation. It's left to the voter to decide. And, and I think that's more democratic than, than narrowing um, you know, the, the pool of candidates. Uh, we, we need to treat the voters as being smart mm. and working in their interest, even though the masses aren't very good at organizing themselves. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one, uh, because if, uh, if you're ill but very popular, um, why, why, why should that stop the people getting who they want to get in? As you're well aware, Lord Fafanua, we're in orange light restriction uh, with our COVID uh, restriction and um, with Parliament. Is there any new setting to the sitting of Parliament uh, or COVID restriction uh, sitting of Parliament? Uh? Yes, uh, we've, we've just ordered um, a thousand rat tests for mm -hmm. Parliament and um, masks for the members. The chamber has been changed. We've extended the desks um, to ensure that there is uh, social distance between the members. Um, the, the staff are regularly tested and we already have policy in place for working from home. Um, the, the committees uh, may be allowed to, um, we have to look at the policies, but may be allowed to meet online if we're required to, to social distance. But um, Parliament as a whole is already a working bubble. Um, we're, we're putting in place um, barriers in between people's desks in Parliament. So we have, you know, hand sanitizers and things that, and the doors and all the regular used places are, are regularly sanitized and cleaned. So we're, we're doing our best to, to try and mitigate against the spread of COVID-19. But fortunately, we, we understand from the government that um, community transmission numbers are going down and daily infection rates are, are at a low right now. So hopefully um, we're on the tail end. But um, at the same time, Parliament's prepared um, to put in, in place COVID measures um, so that we can continue to do our job, but at the same time be mindful of pandemic that we have to deal with. Lord Fafanua, with the many press conferences I've attended, um, one of them, we asked the Prime Minister uh, if the Cabinet needed the help of Parliament to pass any laws, uh, especially with COVID and, and 
and, and also the tsunami and the, and the volcano eruption. Um, the answer from the Prime Minister first is, is uh, no, they don't need any new laws passed yet. And second to that, he also said no because um, Parliament needed to meet in Nukualofa. And, and just correct me if that's in the Constitution, is if Parliament needs to meet uh, physically in Nukualofa. I think it's the Constitution. Um, parliament must meet in Nukualofa. And that's why this area where Parliament is in temporary Tofoa uh, was gazetted as Nukualofa. Um, it's only in a time of war that uh, the Parliament can meet outside of Nukualofa. Yesterday we got some good news. We got a police commissioner in our country and it's our first police commissioner from Australia. Um, uh, I've been asking these, this question in uh, a lot of press conference and I, I'm slowly sounding like a broken record asking these questions. And the question is on a anti-corruption commissioner. It will be a good day for Tonga, in my opinion, that we welcome an anti-corruption commissioner, like how we're welcoming a police commissioner from Australia. Your opinion, would Tonga benefit by having an anti-corruption commissioner? The answer is absolutely. Um, the uh, commissioner, an anti-corruption commissioner is just another um, check and balance on the work of government and civil service. The answer I got a lot from the Attorney General was there was a time where uh, candidates were vetted uh, by the judicial panel and it was given to the, uh, when it was about to be given to the uh, Privy Council um, for, his, for the, his Majesty to appoint, um, there was a miscommunication between the judicial panel and government on salary of this position. Um, as Speaker of Parliament, do you have any insight on the progress of uh, the inner workings between government and the judicial panel uh, with this position of anti-corruption commissioner? I know, I know the issue, but I'm not going to tell you because <laughs> I think you should ask the Prime Minister yeah. what, um, what those issues are and how they plan to resolve them. Yeah. Um, the, what I do know is that for the past several years since the anti-corruption commissioner law was passed by parliament, mm. um, there has been an allocation and a vote for that office. Mm. Um, and, and I just hope that those um, issues can be resolved soon by government mm. so that an anti-corruption commissioner can be appointed mm. and the money that's allocated in the budget every year mm. is spent um, to keep everyone in check. And Lord Fafanua, it has been indicated uh, by the Prime Minister that the uh, anti-corruption commissioner is in the budget. And there is communication being had with government and the uh, judicial panel. Let's hope it's successful. Thank you, uh, Lord Fafanua, for your time. Um, I know you have a lot of work uh, ahead of you, especially with um, four of the parliamentarians uh, has a verdict of guilty. Uh, for bribery um, and hopefully uh, what was said in, in this conversation has some insight or uh, some information for the people not just here in Tonga and but also Tongans abroad. I think I just want to say that um, before we sum up uh, that things are still in limbo mm -hmm. um, until we understand the, the final outcome. Um, what I want to reassure people is that um, my I'm leaning towards trying to make the schedule so that after that whole process is done, mm -hmm. um, with, within you know the, the the legal framework that we have, we, we don't want people to be victims of the law. But at the same time, we recognise that uh, and respect the the court and the, the process and um, the current decisions and the the rights that they've been given by the Constitution. And we have to also understand that the petitioners have a right as well. Um, so right now, um, the petitions have won their case and um, their petition has been heard and uh, the election that they petition against has been found to be void mm. for some of those cases. Um, so, you know, there, there's always two sides to the coin 
and um, you know where, where we see things can be improved I think we can work on until the next election and hopefully we can see uh, less misunderstanding and um, people can be accustomed to to this whole process and I just hope that that doesn't impact um, the work that the government is doing and also uh, the parliament's agenda because we still have to deliver what we're here to do. Thank you very much, uh, Lord uh, Fafanua, and for your time again. Thank you very much to everybody that's watching this and listening to it on, on radio. Um, like I said earlier, when we started with the intro, uh, I'm here with Lord Fafanua, and the conversation we had today was an important one. And what a privilege and honor for me to be able to get time with the uh, Speaker of Parliament and to be able to get information uh, not just for myself, but for you all watching and, and listening to this. So before I go, I'm going to have to put on my mask because I'll be walking out into the public road uh, of Atu and um, be good to one another.